Well, <laughs> good morning and thank you, Dean, for your exceedingly generous introduction, which I appreciated very much. It's because your generous comments about me are not universally held. Uh, one day when I was still at the Supreme Court, I had gone to the office. My wife Sheila had asked me to remove the bed linen that day. Email Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein, 1053 AM. I told you to remove all the linen, including the blanket cover. You did not listen to my instructions and only did half a job. I hope you do your legal opinions better than removal of linen from a bed. When you get home, you will make the bed all by yourself. I'm always grateful that Sheila isn't the one to introduce me at speaking events. Time marches on. Uh, she retired uh, four years ago after 50 years in medical practice, but nothing else has changed. I got coffee at Starbucks on the way to the office in Ottawa, and I still do that in Vancouver. Email Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein. Get fruit. Justice Rothstein to Sheila Rothstein. What fruit? Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein. Berries, grapes, and nectars. Justice Rothstein to Sheila Rothstein, nectars are out of season and not available, and grapes are expensive, but I'll get them. Berries are too expensive. <laughs> Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein, if you didn't waste money at Starbucks every day, you'd be able to afford berries. <laughs> she always gets the last word. Well, I better get serious. Uh, before I say anything else, I want to acknowledge the assistance that I received from two former Supreme Court law clerks, Dave Rankin, uh, law clerk to Justice Morris Fish, now a lawyer with uh, Osler, and Michelle Bedolf, um, a law clerk I shared with my successor, Justice Russ Brown, in my last year at the Supreme Court. Um, Michelle is now with Brian Greenspan in Toronto. And uh, they were outstanding law clerks when they were at the Supreme Court, and they, uh, uh, they did a, a good amount of research for me uh, in preparation of my remarks today. Uh, I've entitled my remarks, How Courts Deal with New Technology. The courts have been faced with a number of issues pertaining to the use of new technology in recent years. Free expression cases, for example. Can sex offenders be limited from accessing social media? What, ob what obligations are there on uh, internet service providers to provide information to the police about their customers? Do, inter do external devices that help police determine what is going on in a residence constitute an unreasonable search? Whether posting a link to defamatory material makes you liable for defamation as if you had posted the defamatory material on your own site. How do Canadian courts enforce injunctions on search engines prohibiting them from listing counterfeit sites when the search engine and counterfeiter are outside of Canada? Well, these are just a few of the issues that courts, that Supreme Court has been faced with in recent years. One of the interesting areas to explore is the use police make of new technology to obtain evidence in criminal cases. That's what I'm going to talk about today. The Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution and Section 8 of the Canadian Charter of Rights both provide protection against unreasonable search and seizure. The courts in both countries have written a plethora of search and seizure decisions. While the jurisprudence differs in some respect, the basic principle is the same. That is, where a person is considered to have a reasonable expectation of privacy, the police cannot access what is private without a warrant. The reasonable expectation of privacy cases almost invariably arise when the police conduct a search without obtaining a judicial warrant. Well, before technology as we knew it today, as we know it today, it was people's homes or offices and their possessions that were the subject of searches. Today, those same locations and possessions may still be subject to searches, but with the use of new technology. But the scope of the searches themselves has expanded by the use of new technology. Judges will always look for precedent 
to guide them in the decisions they must make. Indeed, lower courts will be bound by precedent under the principle of stare decisis. The question with new technology is whether the precedence that one side or the other will advance in a case is appropriate to apply in cases in which new technology is at issue. And what is it that will cause judges to apply precedent or to distinguish it? Some of you will know the name Linda Greenhouse. She has been a Supreme Court of the United States watcher for many years. She writes for the New York Times. Some would say that she writes with a liberal bias. However, she is widely regarded as one of the best court commentators in the United States. And I'm going to plagiarize shamelessly from what she has written in the next few minutes. The case I want to start with is called United States versus Jones. It was argued in 2011, and the decision was issued in 2012. Jones was the target of an investigation into drug running in Washington, D.C. The police attached a GPS tracker to the underside of his car. Although there had been a warrant, it had expired. The GPS remained on the car for 28 days. The GPS the log of the GPS, which showed where Jones had been, was used to help convict him of drug trafficking conspiracy for which he was given a life sentence. One place the GPS showed Jones to have visited was a stash house where $850,000 in cash, 97 kilograms of cocaine, and one kilogram of crack cocaine turned up. The Supreme Court found that the GPS search was unconstitutional and remanded the matter to the lower court as there was other evidence that could be relied upon to convict Mr. Jones. And the result was a plea bargain in which Jones accepted a term of 15 years less credit for time served. What I want to recount to you is the Linda Greenhouse New York Times article in which she quoted the byplay between the judges and counsel. She writes, In fact, last week's argument found the members of the court behaving as much as our surrogates as they were our judges. Across the ideological spectrum, they expressed alarm at the federal government's core argument, which is that because the GPS tracks the location of vehicles only as they travel on the public roadways, as law enforcement agents could do with their own eyes, if there were enough of them and they could move fast enough, nothing of constitutional consequence occurred. There was no search. Chief Justice John Roberts asked Michael Dreben, the Deputy Solicitor General who argued the government, quoting, you think there would also not be a search if you put a GPS device on all of our cars, monitored our movements for a month, you think you are entitled to do that under your theory. The normally unflappable government lawyers stalled for time. Of course, as the Chief Justice knew, the government's theory gave Mr. Dreeben no choice. I'll quote from the official transcript. Mr. Dreeben, under our theory and under this court's cases, the justices of this court, while driving on public roadways, have no greater expectation. Chief Justice Roberts, so your answer is yes. You could tomorrow decide that you put a GPS device on every one of our cars, follow us for a month, no problem under the Constitution. Mr. Dreeben, well equally, Mr. Chief Justice, if the FBI wanted to, it could put its team of surveillance agents around the clock on any individual and follow that individual's movements as they went around on the public streets and they would thereby gather. Here, Justice Samuel Alito jumped in to take issue with Mr. Dreeben's FBI analogy. The heart of the problem that's presented in this case, Justice Alito said, is that in the pre-computer, pre-internet pre age, much of the privacy, I would say most of the privacy, 
that people enjoyed was not the result of legal protections or constitutional protections. It was the result simply of the difficulty of traveling around and gathering up information. But with computers, it's now so simple to amass an enormous amount of information about people that consists of things that could have been observed on the streets, information that was made available to the public. So how do we deal with this? Do we just say, well, nothing has changed so that all the information that people expose to the public is fair game? There is no search or seizure when data is obtained because there isn't a reasonable expectation of privacy. But isn't there a real change in this regard? Referring to a 30-year-old precedent in which the Supreme Court upheld the government's use of a beeper planted in a canister of drug-making chemicals and placed, the trunk, placed in the trunk of a car, Chief Justice Roberts asked Mr. Dreeben, You can see, though, can't you, that 30 years ago, if you asked people, does it violate your privacy to be followed by a beeper, the police following you, you might get one answer, well, today, if you ask people, does it violate your right to privacy to know that the police can have a record of every movement, movement you made in the past month, they might see that differently. It's an argument that works both ways, as Justice Alito made clear later when he commented to Stephen Lecker, the defendant's lawyer, and I'm quoting, you know I don't know what society expects, and I think it's changing. Technology is changing people's expectations of privacy. Suppose we look forward 10 years, and maybe 10 years from now, 90% of the population will be using social networking sites, and they will have, on average, 500 friends, and they will have allowed their friends to monitor their location 24 hours a day, 365 days a year through the use of their cell phones. What would the expectation of privacy be then? Well, I've quoted at length from the Greenhouse article and the transcript of the United States Supreme Court hearing to make two points. First, the judges see that technology is moving at the speed of sound, if not of light, and they want to be very careful about unintended consequences. How a person's expectations of privacy will change with new technology, we don't know. Today, we can see that with new technology, new technology, a reasonable expectation of privacy is not what we thought it was 30 years ago. It has expanded because the use of technology and the amount of personal information that can be contained in that technology. On the other hand, Justice Alito's comments point out that with people using social networking sites, they may allow their friends to monitor what today we say is subject to a reasonable expectation of privacy. Would that same expectation be reasonable if they publicized all that personal information to all their friends through social networking sites? And second, if judges can see themselves in the shoes of the accused, they will be more likely inclined to rule a search with new technology as unreasonable. Remember Chief Justice Roberts' question to Mr. Dreeben about the government placing a tracker on judges' cars and whether that would violate the Fourth Amendment. Greenhouse contrasts the GPS search in the Jones case with another case, Wardlaw versus Illinois, in which the Supreme Court of the United States found that flight at the mere sight of a police officer could raise enough suspicion to justify the police in conducting a warrantless stop and frisk search. Could any Supreme Court judge see himself or herself take off running down the street in broad daylight at the mere sight of a police officer? Of course not. So no unreasonable search finding there. As Greenhouse says, in any event, it is not implausible to suppose that the outcome of the GPS case will depend in large part on the justice's view of reasonable government behavior toward a citizenry that includes themselves. 
I'll move to a second U.S. case, a 2014 decision of the Supreme Court, Riley versus California. This was a cell phone case. Riley was stopped for driving with expired license plates. During the stop, the police ascertained that Riley's license had been suspended. The police protocol in those circumstances was to tow the car to impoundment and search the car in order to make an inventory of its contents. Handguns were found under the hood and gangland paraphernalia was found in the car. The police placed Riley under arrest and searched his cell phone without a warrant. The search yielded text messages and pictures of a vehicle that Riley owned which had been involved in a gangland shooting. Riley moved to suppress the cell phone evidence but the judge admitted it. Based in part on the cell phone evidence, Riley was convicted. Here is Linda Greenhouse's recounting of the byplay in the Supreme Court. Solicitor General Donald Verrilli, cell phones do not raise qualitatively different privacy concerns than items that the police have always had authority to search incident to arrest, such as letters, diaries, briefcases, and purses. Chief Justice Roberts, oh yes they do. Cell phones differ in both quantitative and a qualitative sense from other objects that might be kept on an arrestee's person. He went on at length to describe the differences, noting that a cell phone can reveal more private information than the search of an entire house. The phone contains the sum of an individual's private life, he said. Searching it without a warrant is constitutionally unreasonable. The Chief Justice's response to the government's warning that a warrant requirement would impede law enforcement was basically a shrug. Privacy comes at a cost. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the majority decision, and I quote, Digital data stored on a cell phone cannot itself be used as a weapon to harm an arresting officer or to effectuate an arrestee's escape. Law enforcement officers remain free to examine the physical aspects of a phone to ensure it will not be used as a weapon, say, to determine whether there is a razor blade hidden between the phone and its case. Once an officer has secured a phone and eliminated any potential physical threats, however, data on the phone can endanger, can endanger no one. Modern cell phones are not just another technological convenience. With all they contain and all they may reveal, they hold for many Americans the privacies of life. The fact that technology now allows an individual to carry such information in his hand does not make the information any less worthy of the protection for which the founders fought. Justice Alito concurred, but was more nuanced in his reasoning. He was concerned that the balance between law enforcement and privacy issues would not be adequately addressed by a blanket bar on the search of a cell phone without a warrant and that the legislature is better placed than judges to achieve a proper balance between law enforcement and personal privacy. Here's what he wrote. Many forms of modern technology are making it easier and easier for both the government and private entities to amass a wealth of information about the lives of ordinary Americans, and at the same time, many ordinary Americans are choosing to make public much information that was seldom revealed to outsiders just a few decades ago. In light of these developments, it would be very unfortunate if privacy protection in the 21st century were left primarily to the federal courts using the blunt instrument of the Fourth Amendment. Legislatures elected by the people are in a better position than we are to, 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 access, to assess and respond to the changes that have already occurred and those that almost certainly will take place in the future. So you can see that while privacy interests under new technology are being recognized, 
there may still be need to be more refinement in the case of cell phones and other technology as to what type of information may be the subject of a search without a warrant. Of course, any legislation enacted by a legislature must still be constitutionally compliant. If legislatures in the United States or Parliament in Canada do enact legislation in this area, I'm certain there will be constitutional challenges that the courts will have to deal with. I'll turn now to Canada and our own Supreme Court decisions. Again, there will be search and seizure cases where the police didn't have a warrant for the search they conducted. The question here is whether the accused had a subjective and an objectively reasonable expectation of privacy in the subject matter of the search. If so, the search will constitute a breach of the charter right against unreasonable search and seizure. Under Section 24.2 of the Charter, if a person is denied a charter right, the subject matter of the search will be excluded from the evidence if admission would bring the administration of justice into disrepute. The court looks at the seriousness of the charter infringing police conduct, the impact of the breach on the charter protected right of the accused, and society's interest in the adjudication of the case on its merits. If applying these factors, the court concludes admission would not bring the administration of justice into disrepute, the evidence will be admitted, notwithstanding the charter breach. While there are a number of Supreme Court decisions in this area in the last decade, I'm going to restrict my analysis to four. I'll start with R. V. Vu, a 2013 decision of the Supreme Court. The police had reasonable grounds to believe that a theft of electricity was occurring at a residence. The police obtained a warrant to search the residence. The police obtained, a, uh, the, they found marijuana, two computers, and a cell phone. A search of the devices revealed that Mr. Vu was indeed the occupant. However, the warrant they obtained did not expressly provide for a search of computers or cell phones. In general, the law is that a warrant to search a residence will include the authority for a reasonable examination of all receptacles like drawers and cupboards and filing cabinets at that location. However, Justice Cromwell had no difficulty finding that computers were not the same as cupboards and drawers. He gave four reasons. His first reason was that computers store immense amounts of information some of which will touch the biographical core of personal information, which traditionally has been a cornerstone of privacy rights. Very similar to Chief Justice Roberts' approach in Jones and Riley. So a comparison with traditional storage receptacles was unrealistic. Second, computers contain information that is automatically generated. Such information could enable investigators to access intimate details about a user's interests, habits, and identity, drawing on a record that the user created unwittingly. Third, a computer retains files and data even after users think they have destroyed them. So computers compromise the ability of users to control information. Information is retained without a user's knowledge, and it is retained even if the user tries to erase it. And fourth, limiting a search to a particular container is not meaningful when it comes to computers. Ordinary documents in a filing cabinet are always at the same location as the filing cabinet. But the same is not true for information accessed through a computer. The internet accessed through a computer is a portal to the infinite amount of information that is stored anywhere in the world. So much information is not in any meaningful sense at the location where the search is authorized as with ordinary receptacles. I said before the judges look to precedents to help them decide cases, but they also have to distinguish precedents where appropriate. The reasons of Justice Cromwell gave, gave provided a basis upon which the court was able to distinguish searches of computers from searches of physical receptacles. 
Well, even though Mr. Vu's, Mr. Vu's Section 8 charter rights were violated, the court allowed for the admission of the evidence found on the computer linking Mr. Vu to the residence. The reason was that the police acted in good faith, the breach of privacy was limited, and the evidence was important to the adjudication of the issues. Well, like the U.S. cases to which I referred, the Supreme Court of Canada had no difficulty distinguishing computer searches from the traditional searches of receptacles at a premise. But when the evidence is still allowed in, notwithstanding the unlawfulness of the search, all of the rationale given for justifying such a distinction may be seen as rather academic in a specific case. The following year, in 2014, the Supreme Court decided R.V. Spencer. Like Vu, this was a unanimous decision. The police identified the internet protocol address of the computer that had been used to access and store child pornography through an internet file sharing program. They obtained from the internet service provider, Shaw, without a warrant, substantial information associated with the internet address. This led them to Mr. Spencer. He had downloaded child pornography into a folder that was accessible to other internet users using the same file sharing program. He was charged and convicted at trial of the criminal code offense of possession of child pornography. The issue was whether obtaining the subscriber information matching the internet address from Shaw constituted a search and if so, whether it was authorized by law. Again, Justice Cromwell found that Mr. Spencer had both a subjective and objectively reasonable expectation of privacy in his online activities. He also found that Mr. Spencer had a subjective expectation of privacy in the subject matter of the search. Although the search was only for an internet address, a broad and functional approach to the question required the court to look not only at the nature of the precise information sought, the internet protocol address, but the nature of the information that was revealed, namely the personal information about the internet usage that was engaged in by Mr. Spencer. Justice Cromwell found that privacy had three dimensions, secrecy, control, and anonymity. In Spencer, the issue was one of privacy as anonymity. The police request to link a specific internet protocol address to subscriber information was in effect a request to link a specific person to specific online activities. It engaged the right to privacy as anonymity. This notion of privacy as anonymity may be viewed as controversial these days. People can post the most egregious messages in social media, which many of them wouldn't think of doing if their identities were known. <coughs> Nonetheless, the jurisprudence is that one dimension of privacy is anonymity, and in the Spencer case, the result was that the requirement for the internet protocol address constituted a search. As there was no lawful authority for the search, the search was unreasonable. However, once again, the evidence was not excluded under Section 24.2. The police conduct was not egregious and the offense was serious. While the impact of the evidence on Mr. Spencer was serious, this was outweighed by the other factors. So while the court had no difficulty in recognizing the searches involving the internet and computers is qualitatively different than traditional searches of premises, such recognition is, when the evidence is ultimately admitted in any event, inconsequential. That leads to a more contentious case, R. V. Fearon, decided in 2014, shortly after Spencer. Mr. Fearon was arrested after an armed robbery. In a pat-down search incident to arrest, the police found a cell phone in Fearon's pocket. The police searched the cell phone, which contained incriminating texts. In a 4-3 to three decision, the majority of the court found the search of the contents of the cell phone incident to arrest 
had important law enforcement objectives, identification of risks to public safety, location of firearms or stolen goods, identifying accomplices, preserving evidence, locating other perpetrators, and warning officers of impending danger. Nonetheless, the initial search of the cell phone was found to have breached Mr. Fearon's charter rights against unreasonable search. But the majority did not exclude the evidence, the police conduct not being egregious and society's interest in adjudication being important. The three dissenting judges also obviously found breach of Mr. Fearon's charter rights against unreasonable search, but they would have excluded the evidence. The most important consideration was the high privacy interest individuals have in their electronic devices. Unwarranted searches undermine the public's confidence that, public, that personal connections, ideas and beliefs will be protected on their computer or cell phone. This was particularly important in view of the increasing use and ubiquity of technology. And we'll see this idea being resurrected in a very recent decision that I'm going to come to next. In December 2017, just a few months ago, the Supreme Court decided the case of Merica versus the Queen. Merica and his associate Winchester exchanged text messages pertaining to the illicit purchase and sale of firearms. They were both arrested and in the process the police seized their cell phones. A record of their text message and conversations was later recovered from, the, from each of their phones. The trial judge found that the search of Mr. Merica's cell phone without a warrant was, an unreason, was unreasonable because Mr. Merica had a reasonable expectation of privacy to information on his own cell phone. The judge excluded that evidence. However, he found the text messages found on Mr. Winchester's phone could be admitted because in his view, Mr. Merica had no standing to claim privacy in someone else's cell phone. Mr. Merica was convicted on the strength of the evidence from Mr. Winchester's phone. The majority of the Court of Appeal upheld that decision. At the Supreme Court, Five out of seven judges overturned the Court of Appeal, found that the search was unreasonable, and excluded the cell phone evidence, resulting in an acquittal in the acquittal of Mr. Merica. The issue in this case is one pertaining to control. Can you have a reasonable expectation of privacy when you send a text message to someone else and you have no control over what he does with the text message? The majority said control was not an absolute indicator of a reasonable expectation of privacy. The dissent said it was a crucial factor as an indication of a reasonable expectation of privacy. The majority said that the subject matter of the search was the electronic conversation between the parties to the message. This included the existence of the conversation, the identity of the participants, the information shared, and inferences that can be drawn from that information. To the majority, control over the subject matter, the electronic conversation, is only one factor in the expectation of privacy analysis. They found that an individual doesn't lose control of the information simply because someone else possesses it. That a recipient might disclose the electronic conversation does not negate a reasonable expectation of privacy. The majority found that Mr. Merica had a subjective expectation that his communications with Winchester would remain private. Also that, also that that expectation was objectively reasonable. The nature of the information revealed personal information about Mr. Merica's lifestyle, that he was engaged in criminal activity, the risk that Winchester could have disclosed the information if he chose to do so didn't negate the reasonableness of Mr. Merica's expectation of privacy. Accordingly, he had standing to challenge the search of Winchester's cell phone. To the majority, because of delay in conducting the search of Winchester's cell phone, 
and because of the substantial impact of the police conduct on Mr. On Mr. America's privacy interest, admission of the evidence would bring the administration of justice into disrepute, and so the majority excluded the evidence, and Mr. America was acquitted. Well, tellingly of the majority judge's personal views is how the Chief Justice described text messaging, and I'm quoting from her reasons in the, in the judgment. All or part of it may be on the sender's phone or the recipient's, or in radio waves, or, or a service provider's database, or on a remote server to which both the sender and the recipient or recipients have access, or some combination of these. This interconnected web of devices and servers creates an electronic world of digital communication that, in the 21st century, is every bit as real as physical space. The millions of us who text friends and acquaintances may each be viewed as having, an appropri as having appropriated a corner of this electronic space for our own purposes. There, we seclude ourselves and convey our private messages, just as we might use a room in a home or an office to talk behind closed doors. The phrase chat room to describe an internet site through which people communicate is not merely a metaphor. In a similar way, text messaging can create private chat rooms between individuals. Although electronic, these rooms are the place of a search. This suggests that there would be a reasonable expectation of privacy in a text message conversation." End of quote. Although expressed more elaborately, Chief Justice McLaughlin's explanation is consistent with that of Chief Justice Roberts in Jones and Riley. As to control, the Chief Justice saw it as a spectrum, and she says, Another option is to say that the place of the search is the device through which the messages are accessed or stored. Again, this suggests there may be a reasonable expectation of privacy in a text message conversation. Control or regulation of access to a place is relevant to a reasonable expectation of privacy. I may have a high expectation of privacy in my phone, which I completely control, a lesser expectation of privacy in my friend's phone, which I expect her to control, and no reasonable expectation of privacy at all if I, ex if I expect the, the text message to be ex displayed to the public. A reasonable expectation of privacy may exist on a spectrum or in a hierarchy of places. Well, her expansive approach to the issue of control brings us back to Linda Greenhouse's interpretation of the comments of Chief Justice Roberts in the Jones and the Riley cases, where judges can see themselves in the shoes of an accused, whether driving their cars or texting messages to friends, they will be more inclined to be sympathetic to recognizing a reasonable expectation of privacy and in Canada enforcing that charter right by excluding the evidence, even where it may lead to an acquittal. To the dissent, control was the crucial factor. Where an individual lacks any measure of control, this is a compelling indication of no reasonable expectation of privacy and hence no standing to challenge the search. In their view, there is a, reason, there is a difference between a desire for privacy and a reasonable expectation of privacy. Justice Moldaver says exclusive control is not an absolute indication of a reasonable expectation of privacy. For example, information shared with a lawyer where solicitor-client privilege applies will still support such reasonable expectation, or where an employer has access to an employee's computer and the employee retains freedom to delete information on the computer there remains sufficient control such that the employee may have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the information on the computer. But that was not the context in which Mr. Merrick had texted with Mr. Winchester. Justice Moldaver noted Mr. Merrick had to request Mr. Winchester to delete the text messages, which he didn't do, uh, 
as proof that Mr. America had no control over Mr. Winchester's cell phone. He rather dramatically explains his disagreement with the majority with these words. In my view, the logic of the Chief Justice's approach leads inexorably to the conclusion that a sexual predator who sends sexually explicit text messages to a child, or an abusive partner who sends threatening text messages to his or her spouse, has a reasonable expectation of privacy in those messages on that child's or spouse's phone. With respect, I cannot accept this result. When I read the America case, I was reminded that if you have a secret and you tell it to someone, it's not a secret anymore. You have lost control of its confidentiality. I can understand the Chief Justice's spectrum approach to control, and you still might think you are engaging in a private conversation when you text a friend or associate. But once you send the text message, you have lost complete control over what your friend may do with it. You may have a desire that the text remain confidential, but the question, as the dissent argued, is whether an expectation of privacy in such circumstances is reasonable. To them it was not, and Mr. America did not have standing to claim a charter breach with respect to Mr. Winchester's cell phone. Well, whether you agree with the majority or the dissent, America highlights an important point regarding technology and the law as do the other privacy cases I have addressed this morning. Courts in Canada and the United States are taking a hard look at how old principles apply to new technology. The Charter and the Fourth Amendment are technologically neutral in the sense that the protection of privacy does not discriminate against new technologies. Privacy is no more or less deserving of protection in the high-tech world compared to what existed in 1982, let alone 1791, with the Fourth Amendment. The information stored on a home computer is just different from a filing cabinet. That's VU. Cell phones and wallets are both found in pockets, but the search of one is not the same as the search of the other. That's Fearon in Canada and Riley in the United States. The courts are recognizing this. Maybe Lindnick Greenhouse is right, and this recognition is because judges uh, appreciate the privacy concerns because they too have computers and cell phones. Or maybe it's the persuasive work of technology adept lawyers arguing these cases. Either way, the privacy cases are a key example of courts having to apply old thinking to new technology. One night, we were going to a court dinner. Email, Justice Rothstein to Sheila Rothstein. Look in my closet and confirm that my tuxedo shirt is there. Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein. Is it black tie tonight? Justice Rothstein to Sheila Rothstein. Yes, it's black tie. Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein. Thanks for telling me. Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein. Or just Rothstein to Sheila Rothstein. What's the problem? Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein. You have to let me know ahead of time so I'll plan what to wear. Were you planning on telling me at 6.30 tonight? Justice Rothstein to Sheila Rothstein. I didn't think it was a problem. You know that all dinners at the court are formal, whether black tie or not. I didn't think it made any difference. Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein. I did not know all dinners were formal. However, I have a new dress to wear. Justice Rothstein to Sheila Rothstein. Fine. I trust it's a conservative dress. Sheila Rothstein to Justice Rothstein. It's a dress that I chose and like. The label does not say NDP, liberal, or conservative. <laughs> I haven't been able to tell Sheila what to wear for 50 years. I don't know why I ventured into that territory that time. And I'll conclude by telling you that as a Supreme Court judge, you, have to get, you, have, you get to have some unique experiences. About six or seven years ago, I was invited to judge a moot court between Sir Robin Jacob then recently retired as a judge of the English Court of Appeal, and uh, Lord Hoffman recently then retired from the House of Lords, from the then House of Lords. You know, the judicial members of the House of Lords uh, are, 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 sub, are, 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 are succeeded by members of the United Kingdom Supreme Court. 
any event, it was a patent case involving a coated stent for insertion in coronary arteries after angioplasty. Before he retired, Lord Hoffman in the House of Lords had reversed the decision of Lord Justice Jacob in the Court of Appeal. The two judges agreed to re-argue the case themselves at University College London, and they asked me to judge it. Both judges are highly respected intellectual property experts. When I received this invitation, I said to Sheila, did you ever think in your wildest dreams that I would be judging a moot court between two world icons of intellectual property law? And she said, Marshall, you aren't in my wildest dreams. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I believe we still have time, so we'll just open up the floor for two, three questions, if anyone has them. The back. Hi, my name is Marina Pavlovich. I'm one of the professors here at the Center for Law, Technology, and Society. Um, having the experience of the Supreme Court behind you, looking forward, however, what do you think are going to be most challenging issues for the court to grapple, or what are going to be more, more challenging technologies coming, let's say, in the next five or six years? Unfortunately, I'm not a cipher, so I'm not sure that I, I, I can give you an answer to that question. I, I, uh, I, I would, I, all I can really say is that there's new technology coming all the time. Different aspects of technology raise different questions in the court. You know that last year uh, they had the Google case in which uh, there was counterfeit information uh, uh, listed on Google, and, and the Supreme Court actually uh, issued an injunction, or at least supported an injunction, stopping that. It went, uh, and so you would have thought that that would have stopped Google from, uh, or at least would have stopped, or would have precluded uh, that information appearing on Google. Well, Google went to a court in California, and the court in California uh, said under under their free expression under the First Amendment, that uh, you couldn't stop that information from appearing on the uh, on Google, and and ignored what the Supreme Court of Canada said. So, you, one of the difficulties I think maybe that courts will face is this jurisdictional problem, that with technology being as widespread as it is, uh, that national courts uh, may not be pro may not be equipped to actually make orders and make judgments that can control and that can adjudicate issues involving uh, some aspects of technology. Of course, within the country, they can. But where you have this kind of Google sort of case, you can't. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, company that, the, the company that was complaining about the counterfeit, uh, counterfeit uh, sites on Google uh, uh, didn't wasn't a party to the appeal in California. They didn't. They weren't uh, an appellant. I, I haven't followed the case closely, but without an appellant, I don't think there can be a, an appeal from that California decision. Even though I've read some material that suggests that maybe that decision was not that sound, but if there's no appeal, that's the decision that stands. So it's perhaps cases, questions like that that will arise, uh, but. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a difference between uh, uh, between a beeper 30 years ago and uh, <laughs> sorry about this, my I have a sound on my phone that I I don't know how to stop. <laughs> Shouldn't be talking to a technology conference, should I? <laughs> Reminded me of the story of of, of, of the the the, um, the choir member in church and his cell phone went off and the, the preacher looked at him and said uh, on Sunday and said uh, that call better be from God. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I think I, I, I don't think I can offer you anything more than that uh, in terms of a response. Uh, good morning sir. My question is about someone who's been in the news lately. Um, 
Over a year ago, when the Royal Canadian Mounted Police appeared at the residence of Admiral Mark Norman, they took everything, including uh, personal cell phone, the government Blackberry, even the computer that his spouse uses. Do you have any thoughts about why this investigation is taking so long? Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, I, uh, I, I must say, I don't, I don't know why any investigations take so long. I mean, I've, I've watched, I, I, I'm aware of different uh, kinds of uh, investigations. Uh, uh, there was the murder of the Shermans in uh, Toronto back in December. And it was apparently only a few weeks ago that the police released the property to to others to, to to start dealing with the furniture and the other stuff in there. Uh, I don't know why it takes two or three months to complete a search, uh, but but I'm not a police officer and I I don't know quite why that occurs. I don't know whether it's a shortage of manpower and uh, they don't have enough officers uh, uh, or quite why it is. I must say that uh, when, when a process takes a long time, it's, it's very grievous to an individual uh, and can be grievous to, to companies too when, when that occurs uh, to them. Um, I, I, I'm changing the, the focus just a little bit. But, uh, you know, sometimes uh, things take a long time for nefarious reasons. Um, in the West, there's an issue over the building of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And uh, one would think that it's an interprovincial pipeline, it's federal jurisdiction, the federal government has approved it, that should be the end of it. Well, the province is uh, taking steps to try to, to try to interrupt that and taking steps in court and, uh, and uh, doing conducting studies and, and other things. And people are uh, trying to bring applications to before boards and before courts and so forth, essentially to hijack what's already been uh, approved. So when, when delays like that occur, it's frustrating to companies, it's frustrating undoubtedly to uh, Admiral Norman, uh, I, I have no. I, I don't know whether there's something. Pro there's a real problem there or not. But for this to go on this long is is extraordinary and it's unfortunate. You know, either the police and the government has to to well to fish or cut bait. They have to take steps, make you know, prefer a charge and get on with it. Uh, in the in the Supreme Court, as you know, the Jordan decision uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, which is controversial. Uh, some people say time limit should have been left to Parliament, but you can see that the Supreme Court is expressing its frustration for how long court cases are taking. So all of this delay, unfortunately, some of this is due to technology, and uh, and uh, you know what what technology uh, gives rise to. Uh, in, I'm rambling a little bit. I'll just say one more thing. Uh, in civil litigation technology, emails and things like that give rise to enormous lengthy uh, discovery processes. And uh, companies and people have to go through 10, 20 years or 10 years of, uh, of, 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 of emails, maybe text messages. Uh, and the resources that have to be put to that are enormous. That can bankrupt you irrespective of who wins or who's right or wrong in the lawsuit. So, Technology may play a factor in, in it, actually. If you'll join me in thanking the Honorable Justi Justice Rothstein for his wonderful speech. And um, I believe my colleagues have something.